on this week's episode of Marketing O'Clock. Google Ads is rolling out mandatory identity verification for advertisers. Google gave us more words, but not more information about their ad credit for SMBs. And somebody needs to call the poll lease because Greg is asking way too many questions. Hot dog. Shep talked about the doggo parade going down our street. Did you guys know Howie Mandel's brother is a locksmith? All on today's show. Marketing O'Clock is your weekly dose of digital marketing news. A proud part of the Search Engine Journal Podcast Network. We record every week from the Cypress North Studios located in beautiful Buffalo, New York. Tune in to our critically acclaimed Famous Friday News Show for insights, updates, rants, and much more as we cover the full gamut of digital marketing for you. If you want to follow along, just check out our show notes or head over to marketingoclock.com for all of the links from today's articles. And please subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. Hey there, I'm Greg Finn. I'm Christine Zernheld. AKA Shep. And I'm Jess Butt. And it is officially Marketing O'Clock. Here on April 24th, 2020. Remember, you can catch our famous Friday news show each and every Friday morning. All your digital marketing news from the week. Powered by the digital marketing community. Join us in the conversation. We are at Marketing O'Clock everywhere. What's going on, y'all? How's your quarantine going? It's fine. It's just interesting that we used to have to like deal with people hammering on the floor above us in our studio, and now we're recording from home, and there's um, a Buffalo Dachshund Society parade going by my house. <laughs> like the little dogs? Yeah, everyone had their dog on their lap, and there was a DJ. People had like dog Christmas blow-up floats attached to their car, and it was really loud and fun. What kind of music <laughs> were they playing? It was like EDM. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's amazing. amazing. Just have up here. I, um, I'm jumping on the Shep train and I'm doing puzzles these days, but <laughs> I'm doing digital puzzles because I don't have any physical puzzles. I downloaded this app and it's just called Jigsaw Puzzles. So Shep, when you run out of stuff, look for it. It's actually not bad. The whole point of doing a puzzle is to put your phone down. <laughs> it's all I have. <laughs> I did a, a I goose thought, the other day. It was sweet. It took me like, I don't know, 20 minutes. I thought the whole pieces. point was, was to lose one piece and just infuriate your life forever. Wait, that actually happened to me on the app because you can put pieces like wherever, like you can move them out of your view. And I was like, where is this piece? I have one piece left and I couldn't find it. And it was I had to like scroll on my phone to get to it. It's dumb. It works the same as real puzzles. It's great. That's crazy. Did I tell you guys that we found a puzzle piece in the dishwasher? No. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, that Did it okay. survive? <laughs> yeah, we hadn't run it. It was just sitting in there. Goodness. Should I just go into the sponsor? <laughs> <laughs> this week's episode of Marketing O'Clock is brought to you by Ahrefs. Whether you work for a big brand, run your own small business, or do freelance work, getting traffic to your website is always an issue. Ahrefs is an all-in-one SEO tool set that solves that problem. It gives you the tools you need to rank your website in Google and get tons of search traffic. Want to learn more? Check out their blog or YouTube channel for step-by-step -step SEO tutorials. And they have a seven-day trial for only seven bucks. 700 pennies. Head on over to ahrefs.com to sign up. That is a h r e f s dot com to sign up. It is more exciting than an electronic puzzle. And today's show is also sponsored by Optio. Optio helps Google Ads managers automate time-consuming manual tasks so they can spend more time on high-level strategy and creative work. Optimize accounts, monitor performance, track budgets, and get alerts when important changes happen. And right now, our listeners can get a six-week free trial of Optio. Go to optio.com forward slash S-E-J. That's O-P-T-E-O dot -E com forward slash S-E-J as in Sasquatch eating jalapenos. <laughs> Head on over to get six weeks free. It's better than the 30 days you'd get if you didn't use that link. I'm not even going to correct you anymore. So we are starting off the show with some huge news for retailers. In a blog post published this week, Google's president of commerce, Bill Reddy, made an announcement that we've all been ready for for a long time. It is now <laughs> free to sell on Google Shopping. Hooray! Quote, beginning next week, search results on Google Shopping 
tab will consist primarily of free listings, helping merchants better connect with consumers, regardless of whether they advertise on Google. The article also says that they were already planning to make this change in the future, which we've kind of seen here and there. They launched that surfaces across Google a little while ago. So it's felt like this is coming and they are rolling it out early to help people find products they need during the coronavirus pandemic. It has nothing to do with trying to compete with Amazon. (laughs) Not at all. And paid shopping ads will still appear at the top and bottom of the page on the Google Shopping tab, just as they do on the main search results tab. But the organic results are going to be in the middle now. So if you're already using Merchant Center for paid shopping campaigns, just make sure you're opted into surfaces across Google and you'll be eligible to show in the organic results. And if you're not using Merchant Center yet, you're going to have to sign up and add your feed to be eligible. Google says they're working to streamline the onboarding process over the coming weeks. And these changes will take effect before the end of April, and they aim to explain this globally before the end of the year. So very exciting. And I feel like this is going to be better for everyone. Like consumers are going to be able to find things easier. More advertisers are going to buy ad spots, I think, because more people are going to be using it because it will actually be a good experience where you can find what you're looking for. Preach. (laughs) Yeah, no, I I was thinking the same thing last week. My son was, he needs new sneakers and he wanted red sneakers and it's hard to find red sneakers and he still wanted Velcro and whatever. And I was like, where can I go to look for this? Amazon kind of stinks with a bunch of sizing stuff, but I tried that and it wasn't fantastic. I was like, I wish Google Shopping actually had products that not just ads in there, like some organic products. And it's here. It's crazy. I am so excited. I've been whining about this for a long, long time. Anybody listening to the show is sick and tired of it. Um, but this is phenomenal for across the board. Across the board. Why wouldn't you do this? And they've done it. So I absolutely love it, whether it was coronavirus or not that spurred this on. I don't care. I want more of it. I want to be able to use Google Shopping. And this is a reason for me to do so. I can I can use ads if I want to or not. But I am never, ever, have never, ever, ever understood why people would use that shopping tab and just peruse an uh, entire selection of ads. It's insane. So it's gone. I love this change. Retweet. <laughs> what else is happening this week? All right. Well, Google has announced that they will begin requiring documentation of user identity and geographic location for Google Ads advertisers. And this was broken yesterday by Susan Weingrad over on Search Engine Journal. Breaking news now. Yeah. Breaking big news. Love it over at SCJ. Sasquatch. <laughs> you were reaching out. You know, I don't know. Yeah, there's not a lot of acronyms for SCJ. It's like mainly just like search engine journal. Weird. Um, anyway, this new policy is tied similarly to what happened in 2018, where the identification verification was required for political ads, and now it's for everybody. There was some notes that if you are a partner, there may be some ways that you can do this for your clients, which is nice. Um, However, there wasn't a ton of information as to when it's happening. So they're starting in the US, it's rolling out globally, it's starting with search, display, and YouTube. And they said it's going to probably take a few years to complete the verification. But once you get notification that you got to verify you have 30 days to get all your verification in or your ads are going to be stopped whoa okay so the only issue that i had with this is um i i like the the fact that google's trying to make it clearer is who is actually running this ad and there's a nice little gif that they've got about uh the coat depot running ads for winter (laughs) coats I hope they're discounted at this at this point you know winter (laughs) coats at affordable prices i hope it's more than affordable Nobody's even going outside. It's not winter. Nobody's even outside. It is winter anyway. here. Yeah, totally uh, snowed today. all week. <laughs> anyway, if you click on the link of Coat Depot, apparently you will no longer go through to the website, which makes zero sense to me. And you can then click and find out about the advertiser. So according to this GIF that they put out, you click on the, the URL in the ad called Coat Depot, 
and then you're allowed to go and learn about the advertiser. It pulls up the actual name of the company, which is nice. Some companies have a lot of different URLs. So you could see easily that, you know, this this ad that looks like it's Coke Depot is really being paid for by Jacket Depot and it's one big front. Um, <laughs> but there was a lot of, of questions on this saying, well, if you are trying to make it so that people are look, clicking and learning about the advertiser, you're still making people click right over where your ad is. And you have to kind of see this. We'll put it in our show notes, this exact GIF. Um, but what happens if you miss, right? What if you're trying to get click what about the advertiser and you click on the ad? And the advertiser's paying them to pay. That's crazy. Yeah, who's paying for these clicks? And I think it's even weirder that you have to click on a URL to learn about the advertiser. Out of everything in the world, I would imagine the URL would be the one thing that sends me where I want to go. So those are my two questions is what happens with all these errant clicks when somebody is trying to learn about the advertiser and slips and misses and costs you money? And then B, why don't you just send people over to the, the final URL where you click on that in the ad? So two questions left unanswered for me. So I had this whole thing that I was going to say to start my news piece here about how for the first time, maybe ever in history, marketers complained about something and got their way. But I, I can't even say that because Greg just got his wish for free Google shopping. So that said... The news is the campaign budget optimization is no longer going to be mandatory in Facebook ads. Still, you, right? Thank you. Still worth rejoicing. So you heard it right. Facebook has officially killed off the impending switch over to campaign level budgets. And to be clear, we can't exactly confirm that complaining is what made Facebook decide not to push this, but I'm just saying. Jess, I'll give it to you. This is a 10 on the rejoiceable scale. Yes. Thank you. I wasn't going to bring it up. <laughs> I, I got to say, I thought going into this quarantine, there were going to be discrepancies and maybe not as much news as there used to be. There's like more news than ever. This yeah. might be the heaviest, most actually influential news week of the entire year so far. It's crazy. Okay. So for anyone that liked campaign level budgets in Facebook, it will still remain an option. So that's fine. You're just not going to be forced into it anymore. So that means that fans of the ad set budget management, which is where it used to be only, they can keep their level of control right where they liked it. So I think that's great. It's good to have options. And as the lovely Susan Winograd noted in her article on SEJ, Sasquatch eating jalapenos, advertisers have seen both types of budget management work well in some industries and not in others. So keep doing what works for you. Nobody's going to be forced into any certain level of campaign or ad group budget management. And that's wonderful. And Marketing O'Clock's own Mark from Marketing, Mark underscore from underscore MKTG on Twitter said, yeehaw, cowboy hat face smiley emoji. So glad I forced myself to start switching strategies over to CBO last April in order to prepare for the change. Upside down smiley, upside down smiley, upside down smiley. I guess procrastination is the winning strategy after all. Hashtag FB ads, hashtag PPC, hashtag end me. <laughs> Hashtag tell us how you really feel, Mark. <laughs> he also said good morning to us today by saying I'm alive. <laughs> Somebody needs to check on him. I checked on him. He's doing good. I think he's just done with the quarantine here. We got to have him back on in uh, one of these coming weeks. He, he always gets ready for this. <laughs> Okay, so you guys may remember from a couple weeks ago that Google pledged to help small and medium-sized businesses amidst the pandemic with $340 million worth of Google Ads credits in their accounts. They recently updated the documentation to clarify these credits. Um, in reality, they gave us some more words and they didn't really give us a lot more details. Can I can I make an argument that they somehow muddied the water even more? Yeah, I'm just I don't know how I'm going to get through this without laughing. <laughs> it's crazy. So they did start okay. They helped us understand a little bit about who is eligible. So who is eligible for the ad credit is a frequently asked question on the blog post. And they said small to medium sized businesses globally who have spent with Google ads account with a Google ads account in 10 out of 12 months in 2019 and in January and or February of this year. Great. So next you guys are probably thinking, what is considered a small to medium sized business. So they have that in the FAQs. It says, how do you identify a small to medium sized business? And this is the answer. Would Ruth's Chris be on there? I don't know. You tell me after I redo the definition. Okay. 
We have a global team that is specifically designed to consult with and support the needs of small and medium-sized businesses around the world. And the ads credits will be supporting those businesses. We work with SMBs worldwide from local stores to companies with hundreds of employees and many locations. What? (laughs) They have people trying to help support the needs of small and medium-sized businesses around the world? Why have we never met these people? Where are they? How come they don't talk to their advertisers? How can we get them on a helpline? Where are these people? What is the team? The global team? Where have they been? Maybe they've just been like in lockdown somewhere. And this is their time to come out and consult. I've never met any team trying to help small and medium-sized businesses. It is, first of all, an outright lie, as you're saying, Greg, but secondly, it does not even kind of answer the question, like, am I watching a beauty pageant or a political debate? I read it four times. It does not answer the question at all. (laughs) No, you've got a a, a team that nobody's ever seen before or heard from before that's specifically designed to consult and support the needs of these businesses around the world that nobody's ever seen, (laughs) and ad credits will support these businesses. Okay. Who's, who's getting this consulting? Has anybody ever, like, I've never met anybody that's, that's met with this global team that's consulting to help out. And then is the team doling out the, the credits? It's crazy. Me neither. I know they do spend a lot of time on that um, small business Twitter, but that's all I've seen. So your next question is probably how much are these credits worth, as anyone would wonder. And this is their answer to that. The ad credit amount will vary by customer based on past Google ad spend and the country and currency where the business and Google ads account is set up. So they make this huge deal about how everyone only gets one ad credit, one, 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 but they're all going to be worth different things. And and we don't know how much that is. This was far more complicated than ever had to be. You could, you could easily say we're going to be like this PPP program and say, we've got $340 million. We're going to give everybody credit. It's going to be 1% of everything you spent if you meet these parameters. But there's a secret global team and you're getting one credit that isn't worth anything. And then it depends based off of where you are and what your currency is in your past spend, it doesn't make any sense. It should just be a percentage. We'll give you 1% back. We'll give you an extra 1% to spend here you go. That would make too much sense. <laughs> it's a, so everybody gets a credit. Okay. And everybody's credits are different. And then credits are based differently based on country and currency. So people are getting money, right? Can we just say you're getting money? You're getting your one credit is equal to some certain amount of money. They literally don't even say that. It could be like not money at all. It's crazy. So let me just try to take this positive. They're giving people something. So I appreciate it, Google Ads, and I'm sorry. I just sometimes your communication is comes off so snooty with the fact that you don't try to communicate anything. It's just it's it's beyond belief sometimes that. And I'm sure this started off well, where people are like, "Well, yeah, check it out. It's anybody that's a small, medium-sized business. It meets certain parameters." And then it turns into, "Oh, we some it goes through a, a PR team and they turn it into a no oh, there's a global team that's that's out there somewhere that you know we got them don't worry and it's just it turns into something that is unrecognizable and unhelpful mm-hmm. but hopefully we do get these credits and can spend them and buy some ads totally and they're rolling out in May apparently if they truly do exist they can be applied to future ad spend and if you're one of the lucky few who is eligible, you're going to receive a notification and they will expire at the end of 2020. Yep. And there is no way to find out if that is you. So you have to look in your account and see if there is a notification. You cannot find out. You cannot contact the global team. The global team contacts you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, last September, you may remember Google search marked its 20th anniversary and there were some big plans for the future. One of the things, my favorite things was the fact that Google brought out Discover to the masses, and we've seen that now become monetized. I'm a big Discover fan. And at the time, they had talked about dynamic organization for search results. We've seen a little bit of that in mobile, where uh, you could do perform a search, 
and there would be subtopics that would show up under that search. So you might search for something like, oh, a Datsun dog, and it would say Datsun dog training, Datsun dog health problems, Datsun dog parades near you, <laughs> and you can get more information on something. And this is now rolling out to the desktop. I think this is a little bit of a sloppy implementation here, but they had a nice example, a gamer example for you too, mm. where they showed Halo Infinite search. Oh, I don't play Halos. You don't? No. Plural? Halos? <laughs> <laughs> Did nobody Halos, else Jess? catch that? <laughs> I'm a gamer. Yeah, there's many Halos, Jess. There's many versions of oh, the game dear. Halo. That's like saying the Facebook. No, you could say I don't play Dooms. I don't play Wolfensteins. I don't play Halos. I don't, I don't play any words. I just play Words with Friends. <laughs> words with Friends. Okay, so anyway, <laughs> this example showed Halo Infinite. And there was the knowledge panel there, a bunch of images. People also asked. And when you look on the left-hand side of the search engine results pages, there are now those subtopics. So for Halo Infinite, there was... They called this the overview. Then you could hop to gameplay, reviews, songs, videos, weapons, characters for sale, guides, and people also search for. So I'd imagine this is going to be for much bigger category searches. I think this is very smart for Google. The example alone will likely be quite profitable. You know, when people search for something like Halo Infinite, it's hard really to monetize that if you're Google because you're trying to just get people information quick and it, there's not a lot of other intent around that. So if people do that and click quickly for, for sale, I mean, that's great. You know, if you had something like, um, again, shopping, you know, like let's say it's sneakers and you've got red sneakers and shopping for sale and, and things like that, um, you know, reviews. A lot of the searches that have more um, specific intent associated with it uh, are also easier to monetize. So I think this is a smart move for Google. If it was implemented better, I'd like it for, for users. It just really looks busy right now. You've got these dual columns. I, I, don't, I don't know. I'm not a fan visually, but I'm a fan of the thought process behind it. What did you guys think? Yeah, I'd like to see it with other topics, I guess. Like I can't wait, think- wait, wait, you're a gamer. Wait, how, how's gamer life going, by the way? Um, I told you I don't play Halos. So I guess with words with friends, like, I don't know what it would be, like, different words. <laughs> how to cheat words with friends. <laughs> how to get the ads. <laughs> Links to the um, dictionary. Seriously. So, yeah, I, I guess if you did, like, a music artist, it could be, like, songs, tickets, merchandise. I don't know. I'm just trying to picture it with other applications. Do you have an artist in mind? Oh, Taylor Swift. <laughs> you guys just canceled her concert? Oh, no. What are you going to do with your shirt? It's just really sad. I mean, I'll wear it in my house alone. <laughs> All right. Now we're on to our good vibes and marketing win segment, which I think this might be the last week of it. I guess people are over the good vibes here. <laughs> I think people have either completely given up or are just they don't have any wins. I don't know. I don't really know. But each week on our Marketing Clock Twitter account at Marketing Clock, we ask for any marketing wins people have had for the week at the beginning of the quarantine and the pandemic and the economic collapse and all this fun stuff. We actually got a lot of responses. And now it's been dwindling to this last week where we had nothing. So nobody had good advice of marketing wins but us. So we're going to go through everything that was a win for us. And first off, we got another great review from Amir Zabini, and he said, listening length because of Shep. Yes, guys, I listen most of all because of Shep. No Shep, no listening until the end, smiley face. <laughs> and this can jump to the fact that we did a scientific study looking at episodes with Shep and without Shep. And with Shep, people listen at least 15% longer especially Amir. So thank you for that review, Amir. Five Amir, stars, Amir. Five, Amir, we give you five stars. Thank you. Um, any any other wins you guys had this week? Good vibes? Anything? Um, the Jackson Parade. I mean, that's, that's all that really matters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got eight hours of sleep last night. That was a thing. <laughs> I think that 
that's what it is. You know, we're back. We're getting back to normal and things are just good now. So you don't even notice the wins, you know? It's yeah, a it's all very positive spin. I like it. We're, we're going to retire this one after this week. Now it's time for this week's take of the week. This is a hashtag fire digital marketing take with extra spice served up for you. We simply deliver the take for your consumption. We give no opinions. We don't influence. You make the call. And this week's take of the week comes from former Googler, now the CMO, Adam Singer. And I think he's Austin now. He used to be in San Francisco. He's now the CMO over at Think3. And he was at Google Analytics team for uh, about 10 years or so. So Frank Pasquale, at Frank Pasquale on Twitter, had a tweet quoting an article from The Atlantic. And the article was called How Facebook Works for Trump. And Frank quoted the tweet saying, Facebook's advertising algorithm has gotten so much better at automating campaign management that it can now easily outperform a human manager. Thus, FB advises campaigns to embrace a certain agnosticism towards which policies or ideals they advance. So a little bit political, but I mean, I'm not a political dude here. So we're going to just talk about what Adam said. And he quote tweeted this. He quote tweeted Frank and said, they wish Goog has tried to remove humans from the equation for two decades and still hasn't succeeded. If automated suggestions can beat your ad ops team, you need a new one. Citation, have worked at Google for almost a decade and run FB ads equally as long. This is false. Yeah, (laughs) totally false. Adam has quite the resume. He worked at Google for a decade while running Facebook ads. It's pretty cool. Well, he, he he was buying Facebook ads, obviously. Oh, for Google. Oh, for probably other companies as well, but he knows what he's talking about. Impressive, yeah. Yes, and I like the fact that he quote tweeted it, and <laughs> this is false. So many people dance around stuff, and Adam's just like, oh, yep, this and this is not right. And, and Frank is wrong. You can't just, you cannot, and, and you two know this, right? Like, you can net, you, we've seen it where people just buy things, just trust the algorithm and say, all right, we're going to maximize clicks. We're going to maximize conversions. We're going to maximize conversion value. Here we go. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. And to generalize something and say, all you need to do is use automation. It's not that you need intelligence behind it. Automation is huge. Automation helps, but it is completely false to say that you can outperform a human manager. It's incredibly false. Incredibly false. Mm-hmm. Also it's love calling Google Goog. Goog. <laughs> Mark, I mean, that's a stock ticker too. So uh, he's, a, he's a big stock, stonks guy over there. And now it's time for this week's I See Why Am I. This is something you just might not have seen. Maybe something that you overlooked. But you shouldn't have. And this week's tweet comes from Michael Taylor, at two Michael Taylor on Twitter. And he said, just had a really wild call with Google. They said that, what is that little, little squiggly line? Tilda? Squiggly line. Any, t- is that a tilde? I think so. You should okay. know. You put it in your email signature. I know. I Yeah. Uh, it's a snake. <laughs> oh, <the> snake. <laughs> <laughs> said, squig- okay. So I'm going to redo this here. Just said, just had a really wild call with Google. And they said that squiggly line, any change, squiggly line, <laughs> to a campaign <laughs> resets learning to zero, like a new campaign for three to seven days. This is big. Every serious advertiser makes daily, parentheses, hourly, question mark, and parentheses, changes. And this will be killing performance. So this came out. A lot of people are talking about this. He had 43 likes, a lot of conversation back and forth on this. He had gone through, and apparently this was for, like he said, any the squiggly line, any change squiggly line. So that would mean... Uh, anything eCPC because it's enhanced cost per click, not just smart bidding stuff is what his rep had said. That's a big deal if it's really true that every single time you make a change, the learning resets is crazy. Really crazy. So then Sean McGinnis at Sean McGinnis on Twitter said, my rep just confirmed this is not an accurate statement said it is not true that any change will throw a campaign back into learning and when a campaign is in learning it does not reset learning to zero 
So I don't know what's happening. People were talking about talking to Michael that this was the truth. I think in reality, people over at Google just don't really know exactly what's happening. Exactly. And like some of these people that are talking to us, we've learned aren't even people that work for Google. So you just don't know what to believe. Yeah. I mean, what we really need is, in all honesty, we need a global team specifically designed to consult <laughs> with and support the needs of small and medium-sized businesses around the world. Oh, Greg, we already have that. <laughs> oh, I forgot. We, we got to hook them up with Michael and Sean then. But I, we'll put it in the show notes. It's, it's, it's a thread and conversation worth following if you're in paid, because if that is actually true, I, well, he, my two cents, it can't be true because you wouldn't ever put these recommendations through if it's going to take three to seven days to actually learn from it. For these huge budgets, you it would be in such misalignment for Google to recommend that people make changes and they force people and partners to make changes if it resets learning and doesn't use that intelligence for three to seven days, that would be criminal. I don't say that a lot, but that would be criminal. Criminal. <laughs> criminal. Can't see. Is that Michael Jackson over there? I'm Phoebe Judd, and this is Criminal. <laughs> now it's time for this week's lightning round. Pew, pew. At this point in the show, we split up our content into three parts. Paid, organic, and social. This week's paid lightning round is brought to you by Optio. Optio makes managing Google Ads accounts simple and efficient. In a pandemic, global recession, economic collapse world where kids are running around behind you while you're recording podcasts, you need an extra set of eyes, but you probably don't want to pay them the full salary that they might need. But Optio can come in and take care of that. They're a robot recommendation tool that I use every single day. It brings me so much joy when I see these Optio emails come in and I see that the impressions have spiked or clicks have spiked or dropped. It lets you be alerted to what matters the most when you are in an unprecedented time and like we are today. So Jess, how do you use Optio? So like most serious gamers, most serious advertisers don't really care for in-app ads. They tend to yield a ton of clicks with very few conversions, if any. And Optio knows that, and it's looking out for you. So if you're not already excluding mobile apps from your display campaigns and Optio sees that these placements are underperforming, it'll trigger an improvement recommendation and show you the performance data associated with apps so you can make that choice for yourself. But should you agree that excluding mobile apps is the best move for your campaign, Optio will implement the change for you, which is especially nice in this case because setting up app exclusions yourself is a really rather an annoying process. So it's really, really nice that Optio does that. To learn more and get a six-week free trial of Optio, go to optio.com forward slash S-E-J. That's O-P-T-E-O dot com forward slash S-E-J. Let's start off the paid lightning round this week with some more positive news. CNN is doing something really nice. They are matching any ad spend on CNN digital platforms with inventory for the same dollar amount from now until the end of April. So advertisers can then use this credit to run more ads on CNN, kind of a buy one, get one free deal, or they can also choose to donate it to the ad council to run PSAs, or they can donate it to a charity of their choice. So very nice. Thank you, CNN. Quora has redesigned their ads interface. Probably the most eventful change is that they have also, they have changed the name of conversions to events. And there's a lot going on here. They've improved the date range selection process and added a campaign setup progress bar, which is nice. Um, But the bottom line here is it looks more modern and easy to use. Check it out if you use Quora ads. I don't know if I like that changing conversions to events. Yeah, so it seems like they're kind of counting on smaller wins. Like it doesn't have to be a full conversion. I don't love it either. Okay, like engagement. Oh, that's even scarier. I, I never like it when people talk about engagement. Engagement's even scarier. That would be worse. Yeah. And I mean, geez, marriage? Get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Next up, Google Ads announced that they are waiving the ad serving fees for publishers on their Google Ad Manager product. I just had to try to say that three times because <laughs> they name all their things the same. It's not Google Ads Manager. They're offline 
campaign updating tool. It is Google Ad Manager, aka if you're a publisher and you use AdSense to serve ads on your site, they may be waiving the ad serving fee. Chep, I appreciate your struggle with this because I always rant and rave about how dumb the naming conventions are of their products. And now, now that you have to report on this, isn't it incredibly poor, uh, yeah. the naming? It's out of control. I mean, it's a one letter difference for something that's for publishers versus advertisers. Yeah, versus partner, like partners, yeah. Crazy. Crazy. <laughs> So the publishers will be notified within the next few days if they qualify. If this is anything like the small business credit, I just wouldn't hold your breath. If it comes to you, it comes to you. And next up, we have a new Google Ads feature spotted in the wild by Andrea Cruz at Andrea Cruz 92 on Twitter. Google Keyword Planner has a new notification when you're using it, and it says forecasts reflect market changes. Forecasts are updated daily with data from the last seven to 10 days. Your forecasts take into account any impact of market changes during this time period. Seasonality forecasting has also been adjusted for market fluctuations. And Andrea did the hard work for us and also adds to her tweet, the learn more button doesn't really do anything. <laughs> <laughs> I just love that we're on the level where um, Andrea finds all this great stuff and her initial thoughts are, I need to tag Ginny Marvin, an actual reporter. And I need to tag marketing your clock. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's crazy. Thanks, Andrea. We appreciate it though, Andrea. And we have another new Google Ads feature. If you are running call-only ads, you will now have the option to add a website link. So Google says in this tweet about it that they're doing it because if you have like a lot of call volume coming in, you can redirect people to your website, but it essentially makes your ad not a call-only ad. So that's fun. Yeah, and I actually appreciate this where you're able to not just open up a number on your phone, pay for the number to be opened up, but not actually pay for the call. That's the weird thing is for a lot of these, people didn't necessarily know that they were going to be calling. Um, I mean, they should know that because the numbers on what they're clicking on, but a lot of ads traditionally is to send you to a, a, a website and giving them the option to see the call and then also visit the website. I don't mind that. It's nice. They might want to consider changing the name though. They well, did. then I'll call ads. Yeah. Oh, it says call only in this tweet. They used to be call only ads, and now they have introduced it as call ads. So I do not believe there is call only ads as of yesterday, the 23rd. Oh, I didn't read the whole tweet, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody get Andrea to read it for us. <laughs> Are you kidding? Okay, that was so embarrassing. Okay, yeah, they're changing the name to call ads. Perfect. Did you see the big, massive image in there that you <laughs> copied and pasted into our show notes called Introducing Call Ads? I did. I just like didn't have as much time as Andrea <laughs> to actually read the notification. So next, we have an article that was brought to our attention by friend of the show, Glenn Schmezel, our paid Glenn, as Greg calls him. And he hey, we, we, we've cornered the market of digital marketing Glens. Yeah. Do you know that? We've cornered it. We've got... We've got all the Glens. All the Glens that matter are marketing clock fans. We should have like a Glen of the Year category at the clock skirts. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> but we could have a paid Glen of the Year and organic Glen of the Year. Perfect. I love that. So he shared a story from his Twitter handle at Hey Glens. Hey Glen, thanks for sharing. Oh, um, he's got an is- S at the end just like Halos. Yeah, exactly. And Google Ads Manager. So this is an article written by Paul Riseberry Crisp, which is the most amazing British name I have ever heard. And his handle is also at Paul per click. So I just really like this guy. And- I want to start a fan club. I love that. That sounds like a crazy recipe. You know, like his name. Yeah. What are, what are you going to have tonight? I'll have the Paul Riseberry Crisp, please. Yeah, it sounds like Isn't something it? they'd make on grape. British baking show, but like in the best way. I don't know what that is. Oh, you should watch. Anyone would love it. Okay. So basically Paul shares some really good advice for digital advertisers during the pandemic. 
Um, you guys are going to have to read the whole thing. It's kind of a mini marketing article of the week, but he says, make your website helpful, add information like changes to delivery time, sl- supply chain impact, and product availability. Make your m- messaging relevant. So if you sell toys, present them as a way to keep the kids entertained while they're at home. Pull your audience to see how you can better serve them. He has some great advice in here. Check it out. And you guys will never guess who the latest retailer to launch their own ad network is. Actually, you probably can because we're reading the same show notes. <laughs> I was going to say, the I don't want to play. Is <laughs> CVS. CVS. Oh, Yay! man. CVS ad network. I love that. So Greg, it's what called- does CVS stand for? Is it quality? No, that's QVC, quality value competence. Um, what is the C for? Do you know? I believe I think I'm pretty sure consumer value stores. I thought it was customer value and service. You're incorrect. We have to Google this. I I used to work for them. It was in a quiz. Hang on. It's consumer value stores, according to Stanley Goodstein. (gasps) You're right. Sydney Goldstein. They probably changed it for the quiz to be like, this is what we stand for. Maybe like those are their values. Yeah. I don't know. Whatever. Well, do you guys want to know about their ad network? I guess. It, yeah. uh, <laughs> I'm a fanboy, so yes, tell me. It, this is like a mini WTH. It offers fully managed services with ad placements on CVS.com, including display and search. Jess, what's the craziest thing that ever happened to your <laughs> CVS? Oh, my God. <laughs> um, hang on. I have to think. Oh, I know. Ask me again. Hey, Jess. What's the craziest thing that's ever happened during your stint working at CVS? So honestly, like a lot of weird things happen with customers. But the thing that sticks out in my mind was we were locking up one night and the lock didn't work on the door. And obviously you can't leave a pharmacy unlocked. You you can't leave. So we called the locksmith and it took a while for the guy to come. And he looked just like Howie Mandel. But obviously we didn't say anything to him because that's like a weird thing to say. And it was like 10 o'clock at night at this point. It's like, I don't need to small talk with this guy. Was this Howie Mandel after he shaved his head or pre-shaved his head? Um, I didn't know he shaved his head. I thought he was naturally bald, but bald Howie Mandel. Okay. So, So Bobby's world, Howie Mandel. Um, I was thinking more like, let's make a deal or whatever. Deal or no deal. (laughs) Anyway, this locksmith has us convinced that he's Howie Mandel's brother. He actually said it. He's like, oh, that's my brother. And he had all these facts. And this was so many years ago that I don't remember now. But I was like 19 and I believed him. And I still to this day don't know. I mean, he could be Howie Mandel's brother. No idea. I have an answer for you. Definitely not. (laughs) Definitely not Howie Mandel's brother. Did he shake your hand? Um, I don't think so. Maybe it could be that. Is that a I'm thing? I'm so glad you asked that question. <laughs> Howie Mandel, he, yeah, he, he doesn't shake hands. He, he'll fake fist bump you. He's, he's, he was a, a visionary for this COVID-19. Germaphobe, doesn't shake hands. Totally. I heard today germaphobe was just added to the dictionary, but I can't believe that it wasn't in there before. <laughs> Chef, you can use it in words with friends. No, how long did you work at CVS? Five plus years. That's pretty crazy that the craziest thing that happened to you in five plus years when you're interacting with people all day long is you met somebody that vaguely looked like Howie Mandel. Well, we had also, we had this person that would come and flip over all the Cosmo magazines because she thought they were inappropriate. (laughs) That's funny. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know. And then the ceiling leaked one day. Well, yeah, I I would have to ask her like, ma'am, you can't flip these over. People need to see it. And then she would yell at me and and she would come back in a couple of weeks and do it again. I don't know. I mean, I got a set of plates from them for working there that long. It's still the China that we use in my home. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, fine China. Consumer value store China. I love it. All right. Sorry for interrupting. So I don't really remember where I left off, but anyway, CVS is running these ads on cvs.com as well as off-site placements on Google, Facebook, and Instagram using CVS's data. And according to one of the buyers, CVS is leaning on its first-party data through its loyalty program in its pitch touting robust reporting capabilities. I just like, I'm trying to read between the lines here and it seems to me like this is fully just using data about the medicine people buy for targeting and Am I the only one who thinks that's a little problematic? Yeah, that's what it seems like to me. Like, what kind of data do you have? Your your big thing is your CVS pharmacy, and you're in all the targets and things like that, right? Isn't that the whole 
point now? Yeah, Why would you ever go to CVS? I mean, I used to, and then they got rid of Cosmopolitan, and now I'm not going anymore. <laughs> no, everything, isn't everything so overpriced there? Like, you really only go there for the pharmacy. Everything's overpriced unless you get the CVS brand, which is manufactured in the same facilities, and it's the same stuff, and it's much cheaper. Shep, if it was overpriced, why would they name it Consumer Value Stores? Because awesome. they're lying. <laughs> they're lying to you. <laughs> no, but the loyalty program, I don't think that it tracks your prescription pur- purchases. I feel like that's a HIPAA thing that they can't. It's probably like, how many Reese's Cups did you buy this month? You know? Jess, it, it, you're doing a great job defending them. You should get another plate. <laughs> I need to get the CBS brass on the blower and see if we can get you another plate. I love CBS. Don't even. Okay. Well, do you guys want more WTH worthy stories? Because I have another one here. Facebook had an ad targeting audience called pseudoscience. And if you're like me and you had no idea what that meant at first read. What? <laughs> pseudoscience. I love pseudoscience. I'm kidding. I mean, I love, I love trying to understand pseudoscience. I had never heard the term before, but it appears that these are basically people who are suckers for misinformation. And Facebook was making it easy to find these people so you could spread more misinformation. No, 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 no. Shep, that is wrong. I mean, if you believe in in things like flat earth and chemtrails and all this stuff, that is a very susceptible audience for any type of, of smart ad intelligence. You could advertise anything. You could sell anything to that audience. And quite frankly, I'm embarrassed that I didn't know you couldn't target people that like pseudoscience. I have a conspiracy theory. Oh, perfect. Oh, I'm going to target you. <laughs> so I think that because they're battling all this misinformation in other ways, they're not going to know who the people that should be in this audience are, and the ads aren't going to perform. So why would they have that be an audience? They're not going to make money. They're going to turn it off. Apparently, there's over 78 million Facebook users who are interested in pseudoscience. Does that not answer long. <laughs> It's not surprising. <laughs> So this was discovered and reported on in the markup by Aaron Sankin on Monday and by Wednesday of this week. Um, I don't know what day it is anymore to tell you the day on the calendar. The category had been removed. I bet that that category was the most lucrative category on Facebook ever, it's, ever. It's comical. Like they're doing all, they're making all these announcements about how they're fighting misinformation. And then they have a pseudoscience audience. <laughs> what is wrong with you? This week's organic lightning round is brought to you by Ahrefs. Ahrefs is a fantastic tool that gives you x-ray vision into everything you need to know about your website. I can't tell you how many emails I get about all my clients from Ahrefs. And I look at each and every one of them. A backlink was lost. Boom. Email. Which one was it? Was it something important? But was it one I don't even care about? I don't know. I just like learning and knowing the Ahrefs has my back. Uh, we were just pitching a client the other day on uh, a new service that we could offer them. Boom, pulled out an Ahrefs report where we were comparing against the competitor. Ahrefs is fantastic for anything you need to know about organic, about for anything you need to know about what is happening to your site organically. Shep, how do you use Ahrefs? So one cool trick you can do with the Content Explorer tool is search for your brand name and then use the highlight unlinked domains feature to exclude your own website from those results. And this will give you a list of any time your brand name is mentioned on other sites and isn't linked. So then link to your site. So then you could very kindly reach out to those sites and ask them to please send a link your way so that you could use this to your benefit. And you would think a tool that powerful to get access to it would be hundreds of thousands of dollars. But you can get it today, a seven-day trial for only seven bucks. Head on over to ahrefs.com to sign up. That is A-H-R-E-F-S.com to sign up today. Greg, what's happening in organic this week? We've got a lot of news this week. And starting in the U.S., Google is rolling out a new message that lets you know when there's not really any matches for the search query that you looked for. And this comes from Barry Schwartz over in Search Engine Land. And the example 
that was given in this specific search was was pretty thorough. It was about B plus or minus square root B M, and Google couldn't return anything in the example. So they said, it looks like there aren't any great matches for your search. It's something they're going to be rolling out more and more. And they gave a tip to the searcher saying, try using words that might appear on the page you're looking for. For example, cake recipes instead of how to make a cake. And this example that doesn't really match up, like somebody's looking for a specific equation, not like how do I enter, how do I find a cake recipe? But anyway, the one thing I liked about this is if Google wasn't confident in their answers, they said, you can also try these searches and they give a selection of different searches that people could actually search for. Yeah, so it sounds like that person should have just Googled how to cheat on my math homework if they want other help, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. But my the only little bit of this that I take umbrage with is why not just give the results? If you think that they know what they're searching for and you think your results stink, but you think there's a better query that would help them more, why don't you just give them the results of that? Like, right? Am I overthinking this or, or not? No, I'd agree. Like at least try. That's what they're doing now, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, like if, if you if somebody types in how to make a cake, and you think they're going to be well served by giving them results for cake recipes, you know, fix your algorithm, give them give them those results, right? Yeah, or, I don't know. That's what I do. Anyway, next up is something that I absolutely love: the ability that you're going to be able to quickly add a message on your website using Optimize. And this came out two days ago, I believe. The ability, um, yeah, back on Wednesday, they came out with the ability to add a new button to your website if you wanted to using Google Optimize. You can add different text, different colors, different font sizes. And for a lot of small businesses that quite frankly aren't doing well, that might not even be able to be open, you know, the last thing they need is to call up their developer and get hit for a few hours to make a minor change on their site. So I really, really liked this. Um, You can just hop into an Optimize account if it's installed, pop a button up, and you're done. So big shout out to Google on that. And then reading through this, I realized one other thing, which is pretty nice, is uh, you used to only be able to do 10 personalizations on a site, um, and they've lifted that. So now for the next 90 days, you can make as many updates as you want with Optimize until July 31st. Nice. So if you, yeah, if you're in a bind, if you're in a pinch, Google Optimize is here for you. You can do whatever you want, implement as many personalizations. And I really, really love this. Uh, it's just them really being helpful. And, and they've actually done a fantastic job at being helpful in a really tough time for a lot of these smaller businesses. All right, next up, Google is supporting a new schema, COVID-19 schema, that is. And Barry Schwartz has this over search engine roundtable and breaks down all the new type of schema, and it's related to benefits. So if you've got information on government benefits, (laughs) la-di-da, you can punch that up. So you can say, this is a government service. The name is Paycheck Protection Program. Here's the URL. Here's a provider. You know, just don't expect to find any funds in there when somebody clicks on through the uh, search engine. (laughs) (laughs) That might be the most boring story you've ever read. (laughs) I made it funny. It was funny. Anyway, next up, let's keep it Google here. Not Northern, not Eastern, not Southern. Oh, not Northern. <laughs> not Northern, not Eastern, not Western, but Matt Southern is reporting on YouTube. And YouTube will be showing creators what time of day their audience is online. And there is a kind of very purpley graph, a little chart that shows you when their audience is actually using YouTube the most. I think this is nice, especially for any advertisers out there. And it reminds me a lot of the analytics app, the Google analytics app, where you can see, you know, first thing you do when you open it up is you see the kind of heat map. So the darker the purple, the more folks are on there. And I'm actually excited to when we get to recording and seeing the video, like when people are viewing that. Jeff, I know you love it when we record video and are on YouTube. 
Are you excited for this? Um, no, because then I will just like be at my desk at that time of day, like sweating, thinking about how many people are watching it at that time. <laughs> <laughs> well, as long as you're not, people watch till the end, according to our reviews. Okay. All right, next up, Google is continuing to be helpful. Before, you could print out posters from your Google My Business account, and now you can print out posters that are specific to COVID-19. And you are able to change, put in a couple of different messages, and you could say, we're open for delivery, order today for takeout and delivery, stay safe with no contact delivery, we're now offering no contact pickup. It allows you to quickly change a message, keep all of your Google My Business information in there, phone numbers and everything. You can download it now and print it out. I wonder how yeah. many people had to buy printers during this time. Yeah, it doesn't come with a printer, this this option. Who has one of those at home? I do. A printer? I yeah, know. I do too. Wow. Shop, just, just not you. I don't no, think- yeah, I don't think a lot of people have printers, but I'd imagine if you're a small business and you know you're you're you probably have to print some things out. That's why that's the only reason I have one. Yeah. Same. The only reason I have a printer in my house right now is because we are moving our business and so the printer is now here <laughs> but normally it's at the shop nice well print one out and put it on your front door jess i love it i might now back on tuesday it appeared that google is having issues indexing new and fresh content again in barry schwartz it's just the barry schwartz hour over here but he was trying to find new articles from sites that typically are real time like the wall street journal new york times and google had stopped indexing them it appears that Danny had passed that on to the team and that later in the day it was fixed. But just something to note, if you're a publisher, mark that in your analytics that on the Tuesday, I believe it was the 20th, or sorry, 21st, um, there may be some glitches there. Next up was a tweet and a post that Google put out, then deleted from the internet. But it made it into my show notes, and I am not deleting that. And they said, as searches for unemployment increase, we're making it easier for people to find relevant sources. So if you search for something like unemployment in the U.S., you'll find official guidance and eligibility and claiming benefits in your state. So just when you implemented those new benefit schema markup to your site, well, it doesn't matter because Google is changing the search engine results to a state-by-state basis, according to this tweet. Uh, an article on Variety and a video that accompanied it. That then it is just weird. They took it down from Twitter and took it down from um, Facebook and everywhere that it was. That so, is weird. Now I want to try it and see if it's true. It's gone. Yeah, I can't find it anymore. I, I did a little deep dive on it. I mean, I was able to watch clips of it, but I don't know why they took it down. Okay. Anyway, next up, George Wynn over at Search Engine Land has an article that local businesses can now solicit GoFundMe donations via Bing Places, but this is not automatically turned on for you like it was for Yelp. I was just going to ask. No, if you feel like it, if you have Bing Places, you can easily display a donation button in your local listings pages. Again, this is all fine when you allow people to turn it on. When it becomes not fine is listening to our show from three weeks ago where Yelp turned it on for everybody, set up funds for all these restaurants, and did it without them knowing. Okay, next up here, and last up here on the organic side, is that the Australian government is taking a page from France, we, saying that Google and Facebook will have to pay media outlets for news content in the country. It's part of that trend of trying to help out these local publishers by splitting some of the ad revenue. So we'll have to see how that plays out, what happens to the news in both France and in Australia. But France said you couldn't use all that data, that metadata, and Australia is saying you're going to have to split that. So if you're looking for more information, head on over to our show notes over at marketingoclock.com. All right, moving on to social news. Last week, we shared a good copy, bad copy from Twitter about writing effective polls, and I hope everybody watched it because you can soon apply those learnings maybe to another social network. And not really a poll, but anyone want to guess which network that is? Oh, no. Is it LinkedIn? It is. So the platform appears to be working on a feature that will allow individuals as well as company pages to add polls to their posts. And I have to say, I think this could be the thing that gets me onto LinkedIn if there's lots and lots what? of polls. You just want to take <laughs> polls? I love You're taking polls. Person? 
Well, I know you like taking the recapture polls, but I know you like taking just normal polls, like Instagram polls. You take Instagram polls. I love, yeah. And, or just like any poll, like a person with a clipboard on the street wants to stop me and ask me questions. I'm usually game for that. Or like surveys and email. Like I'm your huckleberry. I love doing things like that. Just, it's a pandemic. <laughs> I mean, you're I don't stopping down the street in a pandemic, taking poll. <laughs> Not Fill too much. <laughs> this is too much. I don't know who you've become. I've always liked to take polls. I love to answer questions. Like the census, would I couldn't wait to fill that out. There's always this big push to make sure everybody fills it out. I couldn't wait, and then my husband did it anyway, so I couldn't fill it out. But you couldn't wait to do the census. I love answering questions. I'm excited about the census too, because like I got an, I got an I got mail. At my house, saying, "By you're you're legally required to take the census." I kept throwing them out. <laughs> and they're like, "You're legally required to take the census." I'm like, "Oh no, I don't want to go to jail. I gotta take this. I gotta take this poll." Yeah, it's like three questions. Just do it. I don't know. No, it's, it's polls suck. It's terrible. I, I disagree. Anyway, I, they're coming to let's, LinkedIn. Let's make a poll maybe. about polls. We need to make a poll. Yeah, let's you make know a what? Poll. Just, can I just one thing about polls that I actually really love? Shep makes the world's best polls in our Slack. <laughs> we need to screenshot some of these things. They are epic. The most epic polls you've ever seen. She has no idea how to make polls using this poll software. And it is hysterical. The worst part is we're limited to how many we can use. So every time I try to do it, I waste one. <laughs> Or and then we as a company can't make Slack polls because Shep is butchered all the – we have to find these polls and put them in the show. I think we have screenshots already. If not, we can go back and Slack. It's worth it. We'll get some. All right. I, I, I agree with you now, Jess. I love Shep polls. Thank you. All polls are great. Maybe they're coming to LinkedIn and maybe Shep will do some there and I will fill them out. All right, next, Instagram live streams can now be viewed on the web. And by web, we mean desktop computers. So don't roll your eyes yet because there's actual benefits to this. First of all, if you're watching on desktop, the comments show up alongside the video of the live stream rather than just on top of it, which makes my old eyes a lot happier. I don't know about you guys, but more importantly, from a marketing standpoint, with this change comes a dedicated URL for your live stream. So it'll make it easier to direct folks to it and also makes it more shareable. So can't hate on that at all. And the article did note that with COVID, a lot of celebrities are using live to connect with fans. And they talked about Diddy, a.k.a. Sean Puffy Combs, a.k.a. Puff Daddy, a.k.a. Brother Love, which was a new one to me, um, and 50 other things, whatever he's calling himself these days. He's been hosting live dance parties. I don't know if you guys follow him. I don't, but this is no. really smart timing for this because all these artists are doing concerts. Right. And I don't think you can like Chromecast from Instagram so you could at least – plug in your HDMI cord to your computer if you really wanted to watch it on the TV. Yeah, I think it's actually a really good thing. I know we joked in the past about Instagram moving certain features to desktop and how it was silly, but this is very, very timely and I think makes sense. So if you miss a live broadcast, which sad face if that's the case, Instagram is working on a new feature that will allow creators basically to take their live broadcast when it's over and share it right to their IGTV. Can you imagine the polls that are on LinkedIn right now? <laughs> what are the polls going to be? The polls are going to be like, is LinkedIn the best social network or the or the bestest? You know, like all these people on LinkedIn, business poll. It's going to be disgusting. It's going to be I so be like, businessy. Like, what's your favorite business meme? I know. Yeah. Is business good or is business great? <laughs> How's your day going? Are you crushing it? Are you killing it? Are you rocking it? What are you doing? Yes, those are the words I was looking for. <laughs> yeah. Are you side hustling? Are you, are you hustling flow? Like, what's going on here? <laughs> I'm detecting a slight, like, business voice, Greg. I feel like you're changing your voice a little bit for these polls. It's very no, subtle, but it's hilarious. Are, what, what do you like? Growth hacker or a wizard, social wizard? I, I just, I can't. I can't with these LinkedIn polls. I can't even think. Of, like, it's too much. We should have a poll about Sean. Puff, puffy Combs, what his best name was. Not on LinkedIn. Oh, yeah. Why not? It's business. He's a businessman. He's an entrepreneur, according to Wikipedia. I looked him up today. <laughs> I think we'd get kicked <laughs> off. I like how you have to look up Puff Daddy on Wikipedia. I, I love to, that. <laughs> I know who he is. I wanted to see some of his names. And Brother Love, for example, is new to me. I had no idea in 2017 he was calling himself that. Did you? Yep. Oh. Nope. 
Well, I guess we'll take a poll and see who else knew. So if you don't like polls or puffy combs, Greg, do, would you like a, a colorful Facebook profile? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't need a poll for that. Perfect. I wouldn't like it either, but it's something that they're testing. It's not fun like MySpace, though. It's just based on whatever the prominent color is in your profile photo. There's puke green in the example. Look at the show notes. It's gross. Let's just move on from that. <laughs> Facebook and Instagram, this is important, so listen up. Facebook and Instagram will be adding location data to posts from some business pages. So with this change, the country, and just the country, not any more specific than that, where a page manager is located will be added to the posts that they create for a business. So Facebook notes that while it's common for page managers to be based in a country or region different from the page's audience, in some rare cases, a person may be attempting to mislead followers. So the idea here is increased transparency by adding that location to the posts. So full details on what qualifies a page for this change haven't really been released, but it will apply to pages that, quote, reach large audiences primarily based in the U.S. So if you see this, you can click on it and get more information. But again, it's if you're a page manager, don't be worried. No one's going to show up at your house. It's just the country that you're located in will be added to the post. What's the most important sector of the SWOT analysis? <laughs> what? <laughs> what's, your favorite, what's your favorite kind of chart? Are these are these polls? Gantt, Gantt. <laughs> no, the point of I a wish poll. I could vote twice for Gantt, Shep. I wish I could vote twice for Gantt. <laughs> Guys, polls are multiple choice. I need options. I don't even know what did Greg just say? Gantt. What is that? Yeah, that's like a fancy chart. I don't know. Give me a pie chart. I like pie charts. Where did you get that poll from, Greg? I don't know. I'm trying. I'm trying to think of how my LinkedIn is going to be ruined. I really wish I could try and. Be, and participate on LinkedIn. I just hate it so much. And I just cannot imagine how pretentious it's going to be with polls. Do you think it's going to blow up or do you think people are just going to ignore the fact that it's there? Oh, no. People will use it. Oh, people, Good. Uh, people love polls, I learned today. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I'm excited. The first Facebook poll that you see, I need to be alerted to it because I want to go participate. I'm not kidding. Okay. I'll let you know about the LinkedIn one as well. Oh, that's what I meant. Now I'm just excited. I'm looking at my notes. My next story is about Facebook. Facebook, by the way, and Instagram, I'm pretty sure the only polls that you can do are in stories, and those are gone quickly. So head over to LinkedIn. Okay. <laughs> Facebook has launched new measures to limit COVID misinformation. The platform has added a get the facts section to its already existing COVID information center. And they're also going to begin displaying official information in the news feed of users who have shared reports that have later been found to be untrue. So again, combating if, some of that pseudoscience we talked about earlier. What if they booted the pseudoscience ad targeting and then just booted the pseudoscience people? <laughs> That's like, what really I'm wanna... saying. That was my conspiracy theory that you guys didn't think was brilliant. That like oh, they're just getting rid of the targeting because it's not going to work anymore. No, but Greg, are you saying like kick them off of Facebook? Yeah. What if Zuck did that? We don't even know. I think um, I would know pretty quickly because I have some of the people <laughs> sharing things on my timeline. <laughs> I know. We, can't, we, we need those people. They're so entertaining. We need them. Okay. Last up here, TikTok has a new feature they've dubbed family pairing. And basically... Parents can connect their account to their child's and take advantage of new parental controls in the app. But of course, that requires the parents to have TikTok accounts. So I, I don't know. We'll see how this goes. I doubt it'll do anything. We'll take a poll. What? Which so parents have TikTok accounts? T tie your TikToks to your kids? Yeah. And then you can like you can monitor their screen time and you can turn off like DMs Eesh. and things like that. It's very big brother, but it, it's not your brother. It's your dad or your mom. <laughs> yeah. That Who's like not on TikTok? So I don't think the kids have to worry. Okay, we'll have to we'll have to hook uh, Hope's parents up to our TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> when, she, when she comes back. <laughs> Perfect. And that brings us to our real life segment, straight out of our accounts and into your ear holes. It's time for working hard or hardly working, where we talk about what's going on in our IRL work, good, bad, or otherwise. Chip. What's been happening with your accounts lately? So I'm going to steal something from Cole on our team. He got an email from HubSpot this week saying that they detected that he used the same password for HubSpot that he had for other sites on the internet and that they use publicly available leaked passwords from other websites to make sure that everyone's HubSpot password is secure. And I didn't really know this was a thing or think about it, but they linked to this website 
have I been PWNED? That reference is over my head. Password? What does that mean? I think you've been owned. It's like a ga- you guys are gamers. You should know this. No, I don't know the pones. <laughs> so um, you can go to this website and search your email address and see if it's been exposed. So I thought that was pretty neat and nice of HubSpot to look out for everyone. New poll: What is the best CRM for SMBs? Right now, I'm leaning towards HubSpot. What you don't understand about polls is you have to give people options. It's not an open-ended question. You should just asking questions. <laughs> And it's like, you keep doing them live as if we're not supposed to answer, but like, what am I supposed to say? What about you, Jess? Okay, so this isn't anything new, but I wanted to share just in case folks out there didn't know about it because I had to use this this week. In case you didn't know, you can export a container in Google Tag Manager and import it into a new or existing container that you have elsewhere. It'll carry over all of the tags, triggers, variables, folders, et cetera, that you've created in there. And obviously, this doesn't have too many practical applications because many sites are different. But I was setting up tracking this week on a couple of sites that have kind of the same bones, but they're in different languages and feature different products. So this saved me a lot of time after I had all my tracking set up once. I just imported that container into another site's container. And then obviously, you have to tweak a couple things like your analytics ID and URL-based criteria, things like that. But it just saves a lot of time not having to start from scratch. And just a heads up with this, there's obviously you want to test everything just because it worked on one site doesn't mean it'll work on another, no matter how similar they are, but just know that it's there and it can save you a lot of time. How about you, Greg? All right. My, something that I learned this week that was eye opening. I just had no idea about it, but I learned it from John Henshaw and he told me that there's reminders on Slack. And especially today where I am in so many meetings every day, and you are on video and you can't necessarily respond, you can just quickly take a Slack and not just read it and forget about it. You can say, remind me about this in 20 minutes in an hour. And to me, that's a, a huge benefit that I'm, I've been using and it's awesome. So if you don't want to just forget something, remind yourself about it on Slack. That's, that's going to really change awesome. my life. Yeah, we don't have to Slack ourselves anymore, Chef. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll still slack myself. Paul, what was the best working hard or hardly working of the week? All right. <laughs> Never mind. Yeah, I just like felt like I had to answer. <laughs> <laughs> we need options to choose from. I don't know what's not translating. Now it's time for this week's WTH. Misguided. You're like, who does that? <laughs> just get rid of it. I'm over it. <laughs> Where we rant, rave, and roll our eyes about a trending digital marketing topic. What are we coming to? Honestly. See what had us asking. W. T. H. This week. Okay, this week's WTH is a super graphic that looks at the evolution of marketing technology from 2011 to today. And boy, is it super. So every year since then, chiefmartech.com has made this visualization of all the MarTech solutions out there. They're grouped into categories of advertising and promotion, content experience, social and relationships, commerce and sales, data and management. And each of these categories has a nice little box every year with all the solutions logos listed. It's really visually cute with all the logos there. You guys, you got to really look at this in our show notes to understand. And in 2012, they got a little crazy and fun. They added circles, but every year it's been these square boxes. So this year, there are so many MarTech solutions that the visualization looks absolutely insane. (laughs) And to fit all the logos on one page, they had to cram them into the page wherever they fit and they're spilling out all over the place. Like m- my initial thing, when I looked at this, I thought it looked like a theme park map. I think I just Ooh. have them on the brain cause I'm so sad that they're closed. Um, and the file is huge. It took so long to load. I thought it looked like a floating garbage dump. <laughs> oh, it's it, not it, insane. It's in, this is because it, it used it, at first. Everybody was like, "Wow, this is so unique!" And look at all these different companies. And now it is it is just complete insanity. Complete insanity. It looks either like a brain, like a dissected brain, or yeah, a theme park map. I have this on my desktop. I had it open, and it, it's a pretty big computer. And I had to zoom in so much to see any of the logos because there's so many. 
So according to this, there are now 8,000 MarTech solutions out there, and one of five of the companies on this list were not on the list last year, which is crazy. So check this out in the show notes. Like I said, you can see like the 2011 list is in the very back, and you can see those logos clearer than the one of 8,000 that's close to us because the progression is just crazy. Check it out, people. All right, now on to our segment segment where, what do we call it? The grab bag? The grab bag. Was that it? Grab bag? Change Was that week. a poll? Should we answer that question? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's the grab bag. The segment segments. And we've got first up, hey, we went viral. Last week it was going viral, and this week it's went viral. We made, we talked about a quarantine house, and I was the newest stupid trend out there. And you could just easily go viral if you do it. And then we did it. And it was a, a, it was a disaster. We put a different one out on LinkedIn than we had on Twitter. And uh, we had a PPC house, quarantine house, and a SEO quarantine house. It, it actually went better than I thought. It went better than I thought. I was actually really nervous and I was, I was worrying all morning with shop. I'm like, oh, people are going to really just trash us over this. But the PPC folks were amazing. They're just like, oh, these houses are great. How do we connect the houses? Can we dig underground? We need party. We'll all social distance. We'll put on masks. We'll figure it out. We need to get together. Let's do it. Hey, can we bring people into the house? Let's go. It's a party. It's a family. We need more people. Let's go. It was really nice. And then the SEO houses were like, I know which one I want to burn down. <laughs> it was an actual comment. <laughs> did leave a few people out, but that was really, uh, other well, than that, just, did a great job. You can't leave people out. I mean, it's just a fun quarantine house. We added some people in. We added in Lisa Brown drinking wine in a house three. We try to keep it fun, add people here and there. But man, there's a, a dark side to the SEO community. I mean, this is coming from people, our last going, going viral, where we gave advice on how to go viral was filling your mouth up with milk, putting cereal in it when you're dressed up as your company mascot, and eating cereal from other people's mouths like a TikTok trend. And people are taking this seriously, saying they're burnt houses down and <laughs> slam body parts in a door instead of going <laughs> into one of the houses. It's just and, – and to be fair, these people that are the SEO haters of the world – there's good reason to hate some of these people that are out there in general, but we tried to tried to keep it fun and mute people. <laughs> some people are talking about kidnapping on our Twitter. We had to hide it. It's crazy on the SEO side. And again, I don't think there's a negative comment about anything on the paid search side. So uh, we can, in our show notes, post some of the, the stats we had. I think our, our Twitter traffic was, our engagement was up uh, 20x where it usually is. So um, it worked, folks. It worked. All right. And now on to our freebies section. We talked about this before that a search engine journal eSummit was coming, a completely virtual conference on Tuesday, June 2nd, 2020. It is officially free. And you can go sign up today. And if you sign up and you're one of the first thousand signups, you can get in there and get the all access pass and also a networking pass for free. If you are outside of those first 1,000 people, you're going to have to pay if you really want to network with all the hoity-toity speakers there. So um, any proceeds are going to Doctors Without Borders. So it's not like that 10 bucks you'd have is going to be wasted or there's any kind of profit on there. Um, it's just a nice thing for SEJ to do. You know, the first 1,000 people get all access and networking. Anybody on top of that has to pay 10 bucks, and it all goes to charity. So that is great. Another new conference out there that is completely free is from the Paid Search Association. And I saw this from David Zatella. I believe he is the president of the Paid Search Association. And the first annual conference is called the PSAC 2020. No. And and the PSAC 2020 is happening on the 12th to the 14th of May 2020. I'm willing to bet they're calling it PSAC. Yeah. I just read it the way it shows on screen, and the PSAC's going to have seven and a half hours of instruction, learning, and conversation across three days. There's more than 20 of the world's top paid media experts, networking opportunities, and if you want, you can get a 20% discount on new paid search association memberships. Are you guys going to the PSAC or the eSummit? Yeah, we're going to the E-Summit. I mean, I'm not going anywhere else. 
<laughs> I kind of I re- it. Oh, you did? Not the PSAC? Not yet, but I mean, I'll check it out. Okay. You cool. sold it. Yeah. Both are free. Hope to see you there. And lastly, there is a first Lightning Talk premiere announcement from Google Webmasters about links and JavaScript. And it is happening on the 29th. That is this coming Wednesday of April, 8 a.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. CST, 8.30 p.m. IST with Martin Split over from Google. So you do the time zone math. It's free or head on over to the show notes. And lastly, here in the segment segments is called the not political segment. PPC Hero has their annual top 25 most influential PPC experts survey out there. So if you want to go on and vote, we are wholeheartedly putting all of our endorsement behind Andrea Cruz at Andrea Cruz 92. I just made that up, but you can go on and vote. That's who I voted for, at least. So head over there, and I voted Shep for you for a rising star. You're doing the the paid search uh, here on the show, so I think you're a rising star. Oh wow! So, you and Amir. Yeah, yeah. Everybody's voting for Shep this week. And now for this week's cool tool. As a reminder, our Cool Tool segment is not an official endorsement or paid mention. We're simply sharing something we found in our travels that may be of use to our listeners and is really, really cool. This week's cool tool is SparkToro. It's an audience research tool that allows users to discover insights about their target personas. So it's pretty neat. You can start with a simple search that you know about your audience. So say they use the term digital marketing in their profile, or if they frequently use a hashtag like hashtag Catterday, you search with that and you can pair it with location information as well and find out what your audience is reading, watching, listening to, talking about, and a whole lot more. So it's a great way to mine for opportunities for collaboration, targeting you might want to use, or content creation as well. And it's a pretty nice interface, and it's super fun to play with. Anyway, it's a pay tool, but you can create an account and get up to 10 free searches per month. So that's really awesome. If you want to play with it, head on over to sparktoro.com and check it out. Now it's time for our must-read marketing article of the week. An article so advanced, so in-depth, so detailed, that we simply cannot cover it in its entirety on today's show. And this week's must-read marketing article of the week comes from Unbounce. Luke Bailey over on Unbounce has a fantastic article called How to Build an Email List from Scratch, parentheses, a step-by-step guide, and parentheses. Just quick warning, it does have the world's worst drift chatbot. It will annoy the heck out of you but the article and the content is fantastic. There are a great deal of visuals talking about uh, the different channels and why email marketing matters. And then it's got the five different steps. The steps are getting an email marketing tool and talking about that, creating offers that you can exchange for those addresses, building landing pages, pop-up sticky bars, um, how to advertise that gated offer, and then why you want to start sending regular emails to your list. And I know that we cover a lot of organic, paid, and social, not a ton of email. So if you're looking to build your email list from scratch or if some other things have been thrown onto your plate that you didn't usually have and you're looking for a good starter piece of content, we appreciate and thank you, Luke, for what you've got over on Unbounce. All right, that does it for today's show. Thank you to Ahrefs and Optio, our fantastic sponsors and a must-have in today's crazy world. And if you're looking for another great podcast, don't miss this week's episode of the Search Engine Journal Show. And this week, Danny had Alan Bailweiss on, and he talked about sustainable SEO, some of the top tools that he uses every day, forensic audits, and more. And it, if you want to know more about audit, I mean, the audits, Alan is known for audits, and you can learn about how he does everything over on that show. So thanks, Danny, for putting that together. It is now officially not Marketing O'Clock. Remember, you can catch everything from this show on marketingoclock.com. And while you're there, please be sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. And we will see you next week. Thanks for listening to Marketing O'Clock. If today's show was of value to you, please subscribe, leave a review, or share with a colleague. If you are looking for more information on today's topics, head over to marketingoclock.com for links to all the articles that we covered. 